This video is on a fundamental tool for logic and reasoning language, and we're focusing in on the use of language and how that might be relevant to reasoning and argumentation. If you are taking Philosophy 140, this is related to Unit 1, Section B, and this is the first part. Language is a tool. It is our most basic tool when we are doing logic and reasoning. This is what we use. We use language. And if you think about it, language is quite mysterious. On the one hand, a two-year-old human can use it, but an eight-year-old dog cannot. Now, some people may argue about that and I understand taking different viewpoints. The reason I say a dog cannot is partly because uh, it appears to me and many others that dogs have learned behaviors, stimuli and response, um, much like an echo device. You can talk to it and it'll respond in certain ways as if it understood language, but of course an echo device does not use language as we do. The same is true for a dog. Now, as a language is being learned, there are typically many mistakes with both grammar and vocabulary. So for example, for a toddler may say something like, I already eat it, not learning how to create past tenses, but using a general rule that you would add ed to the end of a verb to make it past tense, but obviously doesn't work all the time. Or saying things like me want that, not understanding the distinction between an object and a subject, and using the term mommy as a generic term for women in general, much to the consternation of the toddler's actual mom. Now, somehow, with time, general rules are learned without explicit instruction, and sounds acquire meaning, which is interesting and mysterious in itself. The sounds that are being made somehow relate to what exists in the world. Now, there are some problems that we want to focus on in this video. One of the problems with language is ambiguity. Ambiguity occur, occurs when a word or a phrase or a sentence or maybe even a whole full paragraph or longer passage has two or more distinct meanings. We, often the terms ambiguity and vagueness are conflated. Ambiguity means there are two or more distinct meanings. So ambiguity is an important part of human language for good and for bad. Uh, ambiguity makes double entendre possible, if you know what I mean. And uh, ambiguity is an important part of rich literature throughout history. So for example, this is a scene from Hamlet, uh, scene five, act one, where we have the clowns who are the grave diggers who are preparing Ophelia's grave and Hamlet comes across them and is concerned that this might be a grave for Ophelia. And so we have this conversation about whose grave it is and um, the clown says it's, it's mine. The grave digger says it's mine, right? Well, that is not what Hamlet meant, right? Mine could mean I'm the one who's digging the grave, or it could mean who's going to be buried in the grave. And then uh, we have this going back and forth with the word lie, you lie on it, you lie in it, lie as in being placed, lie as in laying down, lie as in not telling the truth, and you have comedy ensuing. If you want to read the passage, pause the video and do so. Now, for good or for bad, again, ambiguity. Uh, we have that word lie and its derivatives with different meanings throughout the passage in Hamlet. Confusions abound, 
it's humorous, it's for our amusement, and so we can use ambiguity for our entertainment, and we'll uh, see some cases of that again in just a moment. But obviously, this can be problematic when we are trying to communicate clearly and reason carefully. So another example would be this headline that was seen in the WIU student newspaper, Combat Boots Visually Display Death Toll at WIU. Now, when I read that, I read it at, as if there was a death toll deaths occurring at WIU, and these are keeping track of all the deaths occurring at WIU, which is not, of course, what was intended. Another way of reading this might be to think that combat boots have some LED screen on them displaying the numbers for the death toll. Is that what's going on? You can see there's uh, various forms of ambiguity here. Now, when there's ambiguity in arguments, when there's reasoning and terms are ambiguous, you might end up with fallacious reasoning, and that is a problem, a fallacy. So, we have the fallacy of equivocation. This occurs when a word is used with one meaning in one premise and a different meaning in a different premise. So, for example, this rather silly argument, any law can be repealed by the legislative authority and the law of gravity is a law, and therefore the law of gravity can be repealed by the legislative authority. Obviously, when the first premise states any law can be repealed, it is intended to be restricted to a legislative law, not including laws of nature and so on. Now, it's possible that the ambiguity extends over a larger range of words instead of just one single word. So somebody might say, well, John told Henry that he made a mistake. Now, that is ambiguous. Uh, somebody might respond, well, at least John has the courage to admit his own mistakes, assuming that John told Henry that he, that is, John made a mistake. But could it mean instead that John told Henry uh, that Henry is the one who made a mistake, right? It's ambiguous the way it is stated there, and without context especially, that is unclear. So we don't want ambiguity to be present when we are trying to reason carefully. Ambiguity can also occur with speech just by how you accent words in a sentence. So for example, the sentence, I didn't say she stole the money, seems to imply that one may have said things that implied that she stole the money. Maybe it was hinted that she stole the money, but it was never explicitly stated that she stole the money. Versus if you said it this way, I didn't say she stole the money, which might mean that maybe she came across the money by some unsavory means. Maybe somebody else stole it and, and she knowingly took it. Uh, where you didn't actually say that she stole the money, but you are saying that she did something uh, unsavory with the, her means of acquiring the money. And you could see how some sentences, it just depends on how you place the accent. Uh, maybe a, a, you accent money. I didn't say she stole the money where it might mean that she stole something else and then sold it and acquired money as a result of that. So accent when we speak verbally, orally, you can hear it, can change the meaning of a sentence. When it's merely printed, that's harder to express. I'm using italics here, but without that, you can have a variety of meanings, such as the case here with something like the statement, I would like nothing better than your pecan pie. Now, that sounds like that would be a compliment. However, in this case, he goes on to explain uh, that he would actually prefer to eat nothing 
rather than eat the pecan pie. Uh, obviously intended as an insult, not as a compliment. So that's ambiguity. Two distinct meanings, and it's not clear which meaning is in use. You can have the fallacy of equivocation that is the problem when we're talking about ambiguity. Another problem is vagueness. Vagueness occurs when there are borderline cases such that it's not clear whether or not a term or a phrase applies. Below, we'll, in a, just a moment, look at the word close. Other vague terms include bald. You know, just how bald does one have to be in order to be considered bald? How old does one have to be to be old? How tall does one have to be in order to be tall. There are no specific cutoffs for any of these words. The same with new or fine or healthy and a wide variety of words in our language. Because of vagueness, that can cause problems with reasoning and we'll see that on the next slide. Let's uh, just take a look at what the problem might be with close. So we have this uh, class trip going on and the teacher instructs the students to stay close to their partner. And the student here, Jason, asks for a definition of close, really close, sort of close, kind of close, nearby close. And he's wondering if being in the range of a walkie-talkie is close enough, which it might be in some contexts, but unfortunately not for Jason in this context. Here's the problem with vagueness when we might try to use it in an argument. So uh, suppose we reason like this. If a person is not bald, then the removal of one hair from their head will not make them bald. Seems to be obviously true, uh, acceptable premise. So if that's true and you've taken one hair and the person's, of course, not bald, then you could repeat the process, right? And you could repeat it indefinitely. The result would be a person who is not bald. But if it's repeated enough, right, if we remove all of a person's hair from their head, then that person is going to be bald. And the problem is now we have a person who is both bald and not bald, so one would, might conclude that baldness is an incoherent concept. Now this argument, this reasoning to the conclusion that baldness is an incoherent concept fails because it neglects to take into account the possibility that baldness is a vague term. There are no specific cutoffs but there are clear-cut examples of someone who is bald, like Michael Jordan, and somebody else who is clearly not bald, like Tom Cruise, to take two people who are my age as examples. So we have to watch for vagueness as well as ambiguity. Bottom line here, they mean two different things. Ambiguity, two distinct meanings, where it may not be clear which meaning is used. Vagueness, meaning there's not a particular cutoff on where the definition applies and where it doesn't apply. But with vagueness, that doesn't mean that vague terms are not useful in our language. Of course, the words that we gave as examples, tall and uh, so on, bold, uh, doesn't mean that those are useless words, they're just vague. We just have to keep that in mind. 